I'm Stacey LeBaron, and this is another edition of Chelsea Hubcats. Today, our guests are Rachel Geller and Laura Appleton, who is our Chelsea Hubcats outreach volunteer. Um, Chelsea Hubcats is a nonprofit organization that was founded about a year ago to focus on the needs of cats within the city. We assist with free spay neuter programs, vaccination clinics, and rescue. For more information about our organization, you can go to hubcatschelsea.com or find us on Facebook and join the team and make a difference for cats. On today's show, we would like to focus on feline behavior and we have Rachel Geller, a feline behaviorist, to join us. Rachel, would you be willing to share us a little bit about your background with us? Yes, so I am a retired uh, special needs professional. For over 20 years, I worked with behaviorally and emotionally disturbed children in the Waltham Public Schools. And during that time, I always volunteered for cat shelters, and I have cats myself. After I, re after I retired, I uh, began joining boards of other cat-based organizations and cat welfare organizations and beca began to get more interested in the behavioral issues of cats, much like I worked with behavioral issues in children. Hmm. And so I became a certified cat behaviorist, and now I work with several shelters providing free cat behavior counseling, and I provide cat behavior counseling to the community as well. So when you're talking about being a feline behaviorist, what exactly does that mean? I think the main thing is really learning how to think like a cat. And what I mean by that is not looking so much at a cat's behavior as misbehavior, but looking at what might be a natural instinct in the cat to cause her to do that behavior, and how can we as people accommodate and or encourage the cat to do his normal behaviors, but not in a way that's difficult for us. So, sorry. Um, so, um, when I think of behaviorist, I, as a cat person, think about a fellow named Jackson Galaxy. He's a, a celebrity behaviorist, but so you are a local. You are our local behaviorist <laughs> celebrity. I am. Okay, great. So. I am. I'm the, I'm the uh, local cat whisperer here in the uh, Greater Boston area, but, and I. Uh, to, to give you an example of kind of the way I think is um, think of a cat scratching and a common question I'll get is my cat scratching the couch, my cat scratching the furniture and what I like to do is teach people that we actually want cats to scratch. Scratching is a normal behavior for cats. It sloughs off the dead sheaths of their nails, it's a great emotional release for the cat, it gives their back muscles a full stretch, so we want the cats mm -hmm. to scratch, just not under furniture. So it's not just a matter of teaching a cat not to do something, it's how can we encourage that cat to do a natural behavior in a way that is going to make the cat happy and us happy. So really being gifted at manipulating or trying to train the situation. I mean, you were talking about your experience with children too, so I was thinking, well with kids you sometimes manipulate a little bit in order to try and get them to do what you want them to do. So it's in that same sort of path a little bit? A little bit. I mean, absolutely with kids, there is a strong sense of behavior and reward. And kids are motivated by certain things as rewards. For cats, it's usually a motivation. It could be food. It could be playtime. It could be affection. So it's fine. It's, sometimes it may be finding that one treat that a cat finds so yummy and irresistible that they'll do anything for that treat. And then, there's the idea that when you deter and make something unappealing to the cat, at the same time, you need to provide a very appealing, wonderful alternative for that cat. So, so the whole idea is to create mostly a positive environment for the cat and encourage positive behavior. Yes. And then um, redirect anything that might be negative. Exactly. So that you can enjoy your pet. Exactly. It's almost like you want to set the stage for the cat so the cat thinks it's all her idea. That's <laughs> what I try to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how is that different than dogs? I'm not really a dog expert, but I'm assuming it's somewhat the same in that dogs are motivated by rewards and mm -hmm. by treats. 
I sometimes feel like cats can be a little trickier because I think they do have that um, very strong territorial instinct where they own their area, so you do have to kind of sometimes go through the back door and let them feel like they're in charge and in control. What are the more common complaints that you get when you're on a hotline or seeing clients? I would say the number one complaint I get is litter box issues. I know we always tell people we want to uh, think outside the box, <laughs> <laughs> but people don't like it so much when their cats are going outside the box. So the number one thing I get is definitely cats not using the litter box or using it intermittently. Um, scratching, as I mentioned before, is a huge issue. People uh, get upset when their cat, they buy a new couch and then the cat uses it as a scratching post. And then um, intracat relationships, so bringing a new cat to the home with a resident cat mm -hmm. or cats within the home not getting along, cats being territorial, that's another big issue that I get on so, my hotline. So Rachel, um, just, just in terms of the community and um, cats in general, um, the cats that you work with are pets mm -hmm. and um, they have more typically been spayed and neutered so yes. we can always assume that once a cat is spayed and neutered that their behavior um, is comes down a notch so that um, they're not out looking for a mate or trying to figure out where they're going to have kittens so um, once we have um, our pets uh, vaccinated and spayed and neutered and um, we're talking about other other behavioral issues that might pop up because they're in the house Exactly. As opposed to living outside. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. And, and male cats will still be territorial even though they have been neutered, although not quite to that extent. Mm -hmm. And female cats, obviously, when they're spayed, they're not going into heat and we're not having all of those problems. I have had instances where even though a pet is in a home, um, for example, I had, um, I had a, a woman who had a female cat who was going outside of the litter box. Well, it turned out she had never been spayed. So she was in heat mm. and going everywhere. So once in a while, yes. I do come across those types of questions. So I do find for myself, it's been important to educate myself on community cats in addition to cats who may be coming from shelters or, or home environments where, like, as you mentioned, is a little bit different. I, and, and I know, Stacey, you have some questions, but oh, I'm, I'm keep just... Keep going. That's um, great. Well, I know here in Chelsea in particular that there are a lot of cats and there are a lot of cats that are kept outside and I'm sure there are people that um, aren't sure if the cat belongs to somebody and the cat is, is nearby and they feed the cat and they create a relationship so the person might take the cat in the house assuming it's available for, right. for care and adoption and then they have to deal with cat issues and then they might think, gee, you know, I don't want to deal with these cat issues, so you're going back outside. But somebody with your skill could help them understand better about what it's like to be a cat inside. Yes. So with maybe minor modifications to their schedule and the cat's behavior, they could turn out to be a lovely pet without Exactly. Issues. And I want to jump on something that you said when you mentioned that they may start thinking the cat is too much trouble, so they might put it back out again. Mm. This is a huge reason of why I do not charge for my cat behavior services. I don't want there to be any financial barrier preventing somebody from keeping a cat in their home. So your example, that person can call me every day, every week, they can email me whenever they want, I will be there 100% and I will not charge. The other thing I feel is that part of what I do is I provide empathy and understanding and validation to people's emotions and I let them know, yeah, cat pee is pretty smelly. We really don't want that in the house. And I, I really let them know I understand because ultimately I want them to keep the cat. So kind of a two-pronged thing there, providing the empathy, the understanding, the validation, the concerns are important, um, and not charging. And I do find that I need to sometimes remind myself not to think the way I would think, because I'm the type of person that if my cat peed a few times on my couch, I would just say it was okay and buy a new couch. Mm -hmm. But that's not what everybody's going to do. So it's really important to put myself in the client's shoes, look at it from their point of view, and from the cat's point of view, 
and make it work for the client and the cat. And that's great because, you know, um, I mean, to offer this as a free service, but um, I mean, yeah, some of the cat behavior can be costly. It yes. could be just, I got a new couch and the cat's using the side of the, the arm as the scratching post. Now I have to get rid of the couch or you have to get rid of the couch after a year and that wasn't the plan when I bought the couch. So. <laughs> The cat, the couch becomes an expense related to the cat. Yeah. So, and a lot of people just don't understand how that cute little ball of fluff can suddenly <laughs> cause so many problems. So, I try to get in there and, and be there for that person. And we've already entertained quite a few phone calls from concerned citizens in Chelsea, saying, "Hey, I've been feeding this stray cat in my backyard, and I'd like to try and bring the cat in. And now I see you have this free spay neuter program, but I feel they need a little bit more support than just that because there's." this nice cute little fuzzy face that's been in the backyard that they've been feeding and they've developed a relationship and they want to sort of cross the bridge but yeah. you know they're not really cat people not a hundred percent and they need sort of an introduction to that process. And that is, a, that is a question I often get is how to transition cats from the outdoors to the indoors mm -hmm. and I do have a whole program that I work with people on doing that so feel free to give them right. my name and number and I will help um, but I will say in general, the first thing I do is educate people as to the fact that so many, it's, it's really a myth that cats love being outside. Um, once a cat is outside, they become very aware of all the other cats out there who may be rougher or tougher than they are. There's all kinds of dangers lurking, there's different smells, there's different sounds, there's predators. It's pretty stressful mm -hmm, out there. Mm -hmm. They really don't love it. Most cats would much rather be indoors. And again, going back to what I said before, once you deter from one environment, but you know how to make your new environment just as exciting and stimulating, you can easily transition the cat from the outside to the inside. Without spending a lot of money? Without spending a lot of money. Because I know that's probably also a, a concern is that you know cat trees can be very expensive. And um, so, I, you know, you go to the store and you can walk out spending a couple hundred dollars very easily. Yes. Um, so you have to be inventive, I think, too, you on do. some of your ideas. You do. And that's another thing I do in my cat behavior counseling is I also evaluate the realistic limitations of the client. Mm -hmm. So some clients will say, the sky's the limit. Whatever it costs, I want to fix it. And other clients will say, you know, in a couple of weeks I'll be getting a paycheck, maybe I can buy something then. And other people will say, I don't want to spend money at all. So, for example, vertical space, you mentioned the cat trees. One of the things I will do is show them how to create vertical space from the existing um, makeup of their home. So chances are there's some shelving that's already there. Maybe books can be moved off and a pillow can be placed there. Maybe backs of couches, things like that. So I will help people um, develop that cat friendly environment at little to no cost and I think that's a very important point because cat trees and cat paraphernalia can really add up and not everybody wants a house full of cat paraphernalia nor everybody can afford all of the stuff as you well. Know, some of the best uh, uh, jamborees I've created are uh, boxes, <laughs> cardboard boxes, <laughs> cardboard boxes yes, and, true. And, and brown paper bags and I don't know why but they just... <laughs> it's true, it's true. I mean I think of all the money people spend on cat toys, and one of my cats' or favorite toys is my dental floss. <laughs> so you really, I consider it a win-win situation because I find I floss extra long because she's playing with it and having a great time. So my teeth are in the best condition they've ever been in, and my cat's having a ball. So wow. it's a win-win for everybody. But really, I will find when I talk to clients that you can find something the cat loves, like you said, a, a ball in a tissue box, a piece of floss, a, a shelf with cleaner, a pillow. A pipe cleaner. Right. It doesn't have to be expensive. Tennis ball. I had my cat was going crazy over tennis ball exactly. the other day. Yeah. And of course it went under the couch and I wanted <laughs> to go go diving into that. I want to take a step back and talk about litter boxes a little bit more because it's such a critical I think it gets very stressful it does. when the litter box is not being used properly. There are so many different kinds of litter boxes out there. You can, you know, get them with a potted plant put on top of them in a covered version. Then there's round and deep, and then there's shallow and square, and then there's all the different kinds of litter that are available out there. What would you recommend as the best possible litter box setup in the okay. house? Okay, so I'll speak in generalities, knowing with the caveat that every cat is different. But in general, 
Most cats prefer an uncovered litter box. Um, cats really like to have clear, clean sight lines when they're in the box. They feel very vulnerable in that position. So when the box is covered, they can't see that opponent, whether real or imagined, they can't see that opponent should one come along. So covered litter boxes are usually not preferred. Also, the top holds in the odor, so it can get kind of smelly in there, and cats are fastidious animals. As far as litter, most cats prefer a litter that is not perfumey or scented. Now, again, that's a human convenience. We want to cover up the smell, but cats would rather have a litter that is more closely, more closely resembles what they might find outside. So, so there are litters though that have baking soda and that absorbs odors and yes. that's not uh, that perfume smell exactly. that scented. So that's a nice alternative. Exactly. And the other thing I find is that people really go overboard on the privacy issue. Again, they attribute human right. features to the cat and I've gone to places where they can't understand why the cat is not using litter box and they'll go to a site visit and honestly the cat has to go spelunking on an indoor hike to get to his <laughs> box and then it's wedged somewhere or under something and the cat, my neighbor's cat will take a poop on the lawn, or the front lawn with a row of cars going by. Mm -hmm. Cats don't care about privacy. Put the box somewhere that isn't really far away from the people and where the action is. So. Um, uncovered litter box, non-scented litter, don't put the box too far away. And the last thing I would say is plastic liners. Again, that's a human convenience. A lot of cats do not like them because the urine can pool mm -hmm. and their claws can get stuck onto plastic. So right off the top of my head, those are the things that I would say stay away from and you have a good chance of having your cat use the box that way. And then if you have extra multiple cats, then you there's some rule about <laughs> extra boxes per cat? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is, there is a, a rule, <laughs> <laughs> a very important one. You should always have at least um, the same amount of boxes you have cats, and many people even recommend having an extra one on top of that. So if you have two cats, you should have three boxes. Now, they may not even like to use all of those boxes, but then people find if they're not using a box, they take it away, and then the cat will go outside the box. Sometimes cats just like to know they have that choice. They mm. like to know they have the option. They're making the decision what box they want to use. So always have at least the same amount of boxes as cats, and if you can and you have room, one more than that would be preferable. And then when you do a full change on the litter, don't clean the box with anything stinky and smelly and perfumey again. Right, uh, Do right. you recommend using uh, like a diluted bleach or using, what sort of cleaners do you recommend using yeah, for the uh, yeah, boxes? Yeah, diluted bleach or diluted ammonia, something that will really clean the germs and take away the odor is fine. Um, I should also mention that if you are going to change your litter, a lot of times it's not a good idea to just abruptly go from one brand to the next. So say you have a scented litter, and maybe the cat's using it intermittently to, to, re, to refrain from creating a complete, a complete meltdown where the cat doesn't use the box at all, kind of gradually mix the litters and add in more of the new litter at the same time less of the old litter that you don't want anymore and make the transition very gradual, let the cat ease into the transition. So, so no, no, all of this is good um, information. I was just wondering about the box because if you, if you have just say one cat and you, as opposed to two, um, although I have more than two cats, um, and and they that do and they do and they and they do they do have their box preferences. Yes. And they are clear about well, you can't come in my box, you know, and that's that's uh, there are rules established in the household about which box who uses which box. <laughs> But um, I was just curious, though, I mean, in terms of a, a total clean versus, you know, removing elimination and refreshing your box um, often, which I think is, is minimally what everybody needs to do. But, um, you know, they get sometimes a scent related to their box. Yes. And yeah. I've only, I, I only ask this because um, if by any chance at all um, your cat escaped and went outside, People, people, people say, whoever the people are, right. but if you put the box outside, that the cat will look for the box and the scent. 
Is that that's something kind you've of, heard? I or? have heard that it's kind of, it's not something I would advocate. There were kind of mixed views on that. Many people think it's better for the scent to put um, the cat's favorite bed or something that the cat lays on the lawn or even your scent huh. because um, the litter box may not only attract the cat but may attract predators. Yes. So it's not always a good idea to put that litter box out. So I would say keep your litter box super duper clean. Hopefully your cat never gets out, but if she does, um, use camera trackers and use other scents to yes. attract the cat. And lastly on the litter box or the <laughs> litter issues is there's a Cat Attract yes. product. Uh, can you share with folks what that is and have you found that to be helpful at all? I have found when cats are not using litter box and they have you know, substrate issues and substrate aversion that Cat Attract litter solves the problem almost every time. So for people who aren't mm -hmm. aware of what it is, it's a litter with a very soft and sandy texture, so it very much mimics um, what a cat might find outside. And for cats who's maybe a little more sensitive in their paws, because cats are very tactile creatures, they seem to tolerate cat attract litter. But in addition, it has herbs in it that attract the cat to the box. So those traits make that a very uh, popular litter, and I do find that it really helps for some of those stubborn cases. There's no catnip involved here, is there? <laughs> <laughs> um, and talking about scratching, and we were talking a bit about um, different sur surfaces. You were talking about vertical surfaces, horizontal fur surfaces, and I'm also very curious, um, it amazes me that people still talk about declawing, but cats are still declawed these days. Yeah. And as a behaviorist, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that issue. Well, declawing in and of itself is, is torture. And I think the name declawing makes it sound to people like they're just removing the claw. It sounds rather innocuous if you hear the term. But the reality is is that the the process involves actually like cutting at the knuckles and it's very very painful and most cats have pain throughout their lives. From a behavioral perspective though what happens is cats now feel very very vulnerable because they don't have that protection and so cats who are declawed often develop other behavioral issues. The most common one is biting. They will bite because they feel this need to protect themselves because they feel so vulnerable without their claws. Um, also, cats who are declawed will tend to swipe more. So they're, they're fearful and they have um, a need to overly compensate for not having their claws. So they will tend to, to bite and they will tend to swipe. The last thing that happens with, uh, very often with declawed cats is they have what's called pain-induced aggression. So when cats are um, in pain, again, they will often lash out um, aggressively because they feel vulnerable, they feel like they're weak. So declawed cats will engage in pain-induced aggression because they're constantly in pain from being declawed. So they would develop these other aggressive behaviors. Um, there are ways to stop cats from clawing the furniture and from other these other behaviors that are that are easy, that can be cost free, and they are very effective. So, to me, there is no reason for someone to declaw a cat. It, it's torture, and there are other ways to get to the same result. So, are you talking about soft paws? Are you talking about learning how to trim your cat's nails? Or are you talking about? offering vertical scratching as well as horizontal scratching. I don't think many people often think about horizontal scratching, or I didn't in my early cat ownership days, and then I realized my cats love scratching horizontally. Um, and so are those some of the alternatives yes, that you recommend? Yes, absolutely. I mean, like as I said before, we want the cats to scratch, and that does happen. Somebody will put out a, a scratching post and the cat doesn't use it, and so then they go declaw the cat. Well. First of all, if you're putting out a carpet-covered post, which is the most common thing I see people do, mm -hmm. people choose carpet-covered posts because they match the decor. But for a cat, a carpet-covered post is basically useless. It doesn't do the job, again, of sloughing off the sheaths. It doesn't have that texture they can really grab into. And 
sometimes their claws can actually get stuck in those loops. Mm -hmm. And once that happens, the cat's never going to use the post again. The other thing is, if you try a post, but you, you notice there's scratch marks on the floor, as you said, perhaps the cat is a horizontal scratcher as opposed to a vertical scratcher. So maybe they need a scratching pad and not a scratching post. Or you can put the post sideways. Sideways. Absolutely. Yes. Um, but again, all those other non-surgical options to put the, the, the coverings on their claws, that works. Um, and and um, any of these other opportunities to provide the cat an outlet to to scratch in, in the appropriate place will result in the cat not tearing apart your house into tatters and shreds. But we need to provide those opportunities. So instead of the carpet, are you recommending the sisal rope or actual wood? Or both or either? Uh, um, sisal wrap posts are excellent. Rope wrap posts and wood is great. Those three would be the textures I would recommend. Carpet is probably the most popular because people go and buy a a maroon post because it mar matches their maroon carpet um, and that is useless from a cat's point of view. And then some of the posts aren't even tall enough. If you go into your average pet supply store, I'll see posts that are maybe one or two feet tall. Mm -hmm. A scratching post needs to be at least three, foot, three feet tall for the cat to get the stretch and to use the post effectively. So, so maybe they're buying things that might be designed for a kitten but they're not thinking about their kitten growing up. Or they're buying things that are kind of designed to not be overly obtrusive in the house mm -hmm. or blend in or match. And again, we're not thinking like a cat. So many cats that are indoors, you know, from eight in the morning till six at night while people are commuting to their jobs. Um, if you're a cat home alone, if you're one cat or even two, you know, there's a lot of entertainment time there that, that needs to happen. What kind of items would you recommend people have in their apartments with their cats to help keep them stimulated during the day? So one thing that I recommend the most is puzzle feeders. So puzzle feeders are items that as cats play with them, it doles out a treat, but it, they're set up in such a way that the treat is kind of doled out intermittently. So they have to work and play to get their food. So this simulates a hunt. They need to work, they need to play, they need to, to chase this toy, and then when they're successful, they have the capture and they have the feast after their hunt. So that's hmm. an, an excellent way to keep a cat occupied during the day. Um, there are many solo activity toys that you can leave out for your cat. Sometimes people find leaving the radio on or the lights on timers kind of make signs of li life in your house, and that helps the cat not feel so alone. But I think another piece to your question is kind of the cat's lives versus our lives. So mm -hmm. they're home all day napping, and we're out working. Mm -hmm. And as we get home and we're winding down, <laughs> your winding cat <laughs> is just revving up. So we want to we want to relax, and the cat wants to be stimulated and play. And the only stimulation the cat might get is you petting the cat on your lap, which is great, but he has this desire to be stimulated and to play. So I really suggest to people that when they get home from work, they engage in a very robust interactive play session with their cat, mm -hmm. and then do that again right before bed. And then this also helps your cat get into a pattern. He knows he's going to be getting this interactive play and, and stimulation. Um, when you get home and before bed, and that helps too. Cats are creatures of habit. They like schedules. Cats would be happiest if we did things exactly the same way every single day and never changed. So they do learn and if they know they're going to be getting that stimulation. It, it works out very, very well. Yeah, they don't know the difference between Wednesday and Saturday when you want to sleep in exactly. on Saturday morning. Exactly. My cat Hooch will be sitting right there looking at me at 6 a.m. in the morning <laughs> just saying, hey, time for breakfast. You know, yeah, even just if it like is it's on weekday. Day. Right. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Cats like their schedule is very defined and they like things to happen at the same time in the same place every day. Do, do you have any thoughts about, you know, when you have a cat in the household and you have, um, in addition to work, you may have children? in terms of anything special that you might need to take into consideration in terms of having a small child and a cat or 
If you mean if this child is left home during the day? Well, hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> no. But after, the relationship but between children yeah, and pets. Yeah, so, you know, um, parents are working all day, the kids in school, everybody's home. Everyone comes up at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, you know, sometimes some children, you know, um, want to watch television, have no interest in the cat, but then there are other people that, other children that might want to, you know, overstimulate right, the cat. Right, right. So. Yeah, that is something I do a lot is teach kids how to properly interact and handle a cat. I mean, a lot of kids, especially younger kids, think that a tail is there for them to pull or yeah. to play with, and they're not doing it maliciously. They just see something moving and they grab it. So teaching kids proper cat handling skills is very, very important. But I do find that most kids love to use a fishing pole type toy and play with the cat. So it can be a huge help to the mm -hmm. parents to, to teach their kids how to really use a fishing pole type toy and really interactively play with the cat. So the cat's getting all of the stimulation, the cat's bonding with the kids, and the parents can have a little bit of time for them to decompress as well. So mm -hmm. I do find there's ways you can kind of bring the kids in and make them part of it and just teach them how to do it properly. And once they really see what they're doing and they become part of the process, they find it really um, builds that relationship. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. When my daughter was a toddler, I will say that at 7 o'clock at night, I did separate my, her from my cats and I, because I needed to have her go into her routine about getting ready to go to bed. And I think the cats needed the break. They were tired at that point in time. And um, my one of my cats at that, I also had a lot of foster cats at that time too. So there was a lot of multiple stimulation going on yeah. and she'd started pulling her fur out. So I thought, you know, we, everybody needs some quiet time. Yes, yes. And so I just imposed a seven o'clock, you know, and then once, you, yeah. right, and once yeah. she was in bed, you know, then I would open up the doors and let the crew back out again. And then they would have the house to themselves other than the bedrooms at night. And so it seemed like a fair exchange. Yes, yeah. And most cats um, understand that if they're in their own room, a lot of people think that we're imposing a prison sentence on the cat. But in a case where there's stress or there's chaos, there's a lot of animals, they would prefer it. They would rather be in a, 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 a closed, quiet, safe place. Right. Yeah, right. yeah no, I, I would agree with that. Um, so as we've talked about, there are a lot of outdoor cats here in Chelsea, and it's something that Hubcats mm. Chelsea is committed to work on until we get the job done and continue to have a presence in the community to be able to support cats. Um, we've talked a little bit about acclimating an outdoor cat you know, into the home. Um, are there any things from a feline behaviorist standpoint, any concerns, like say we have feral cat colonies I don't know if you've done any work in the realm like where there's one really nasty cat in that colony and you know you don't want to trap and remove that cat how do you make peace in that sort of environment or is it possible it's really difficult outdoors to control all of all of those types of behaviors because cats are territorial creatures and we always come across that alpha cat and there are mm -hmm. times even with indoor cats that there is that one nasty controlling cat and know what that that person can never adopt another cat so we that uh, happens across the board and I think um, with colonies with feral cats a lot of times the other cats will will form other bonds and will kind of help each other and the only thing that you could really do within the colony is again if there's a way you could provide like that vertical space so the cat has those way those outlets to assert his status so we do find that those cats will on anything that's multi-tiered or high they'll use that to go up and assert and state their status that way and that's kind of a safer way for that cat to assert his and status another thought i was just thinking of is maybe having two feeding areas yes because yeah. this is how we would approach two cats that don't get along in a house you would have you two feeding, two feeding areas yeah. and then try and bring the foods closer together if you want them to really develop, or it's creating two sort of sub-colonies outside right. that might have more of a balance Right, you that can way. always have more than one feeding station, and if, you, if your goal is harmony, 
<laughs> then you can do what you would do as you said inside and very gradually conservatively move those closer together but if you have you may always want to provide maybe a separate area for that one cat if he's being damaged of a bully and, then, and that does happen yeah and then if we have neighbors say we there's a feeding station and then for some reason they the neighbors don't or the the owners of that property don't want the feeding station and we have to move it um, it's in the same mentality, you know, inch yes. by inch. Yes, if you have, to, whenever you have to move anything with a cat, you never just want to take, whether it's the food or the litter box, and just take it from one mm -hmm. area and move it to another area, especially with litter boxes. I'll actually recommend that as you're gradually moving a litter box, keep one in the old spot just for safety and security and then maybe just a couple inches a day move that box to where you eventually want it. So it is hard because cats just don't really like change. I always tell the story that even things that you might think are totally innocuous, um, you know, a new piece of furniture or um, a change in your schedule, cats will pick up on that and they can really get stressed out from, from a change, even, even if you move things around sometimes. What are the sort of feline behaviors that you see that we really should be concerned about and really take the cat to a veterinarian? I think of straining in the litter box, but maybe there's some other things too, other behaviors that would be like, oh my gosh, you need to get that cat to a veterinarian. Well, I will say when somebody comes to me with a litter box issue, that is the first thing I say. Have you ruled out anything medical? Because a lot of medical issues, um, UTIs, hyperthyroidism, kidney issues, these can all cause litter box problems. And with straining the litter box, if a cat feels pain when he's trying to go, he will then associate that pain with the box and he won't use the box again. So a multitude of medical issues could affect the cat using the litter box. But I would also say, you know, very extreme aggression that appears to come out of nowhere could be something neurological. Uh, I do really try to handle um, aggression with a client, you know, because many times it's redirected aggression, petting aggression, and, and there are ways to fix or solve that. But What's some petting aggression, does that mean you're overstimulating the cat so that the cat has, you know, tries to like bite you to tell you I don't want you to pet me anymore and you don't know what yeah, that means? Th okay. Thanks for asking. That's a good okay. question. And petting aggression is something that takes most cat owners by surprise. Because here they are petting their cat, <laughs> thinking they do something that should be so pleasurable for the cat, and the cat's purring and everything is going on great, and then out of nowhere you get bitten or you get swatted. So what happened? So some cats do get overstimulated. Some cats um, are always you know more territorial than others and if maybe out of the corner of his eye he sees a companion cat going on what he perceives as his territory or his food you might be the victim of uh, petting aggression because even though your cat loves you you're right there and all of his good kitty judgment kind of goes right out the window and he bites you because you're closest so what happens usually is you're enjoying the cat's enjoying the session and that it just gets to be too much the stimulation is enough he wants to stop and that's how he lets you know. The way to handle petting aggression is I tell people to get a handle on your cat of how long he'll allow you to pet before this happens. So say you can pet the cat 10 minutes before he, he bites you or whatever, he swats at you. So stop the petting sessions at seven minutes. Leave him in a content state, maybe even wanting more. And then gradually you can start elongating those sessions and always keep it below that point where you can sense he's had enough and also become more in tune with the signal so maybe before the cat bites you the ears are twitching or the body gets tense or the tail is twitching and he may be telling you in 17 other ways that you know what I've had enough and then he finally bites because we're not in tune to his signals mm -hmm. but the the main way to deal with petting aggression is to get a handle on how long he will allow petting before freaking out. Stop before that. This way you leave him happy, you leave him content, you never get to that point. And then 
but again with my example, say it's 10 minutes that he'll allow, so stop mm -hmm. at seven minutes, then go to eight, then go to nine. You can even go to nine minutes, stop for five minutes, and then start again and gradually elongate that way. And you can usually kind of desensitize the cat to that type of, of aggression. But to your question, sometimes aggression is just so severe and so out of nowhere and, and not, you can tell you're trying, you know, things that should work and you're not making any progress or inroads at all then maybe this is something neurological or some type, maybe the cat needs a pharmacological intervention and you may have to look at other resources. Hmm. I don't know if you've ever tried this, but something that's becoming popular is clicker training mm -hmm. for cats. Yes. Do you have any thoughts or opinions on that? Well, I've, I've taken a course on it. Um, I have not yet tried it myself. It's something that would really, um, require a great deal of dedication from a cat owner because you'd really have to have that clicker with you all the time and you'd have to be very consistent in and, that training. And this is similar to dog clickers. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing. You're just trying it out on a cat. Right. Oh yeah, it's, so it's the you, same so you exact concept. You get the cat to do something you want them to do and you do a click, a click and, and a, a treat. treat. And then they're supposed to then relate the clicker to, to the, the good, treat. To the treat and the good behavior. Exactly, and then eventually you just have to click. But it does require a person to have the clicker with them at all times and to be very consistent. And for someone like me who often work with families, if you brought up kids, you have a husband, everyone and right, and everyone has to be on board. Everyone has to be clicking and treating and you know, right. it can't be one person does it and the other people don't. So it's a group effort, so it's a little bit more of a commitment. Sure. Yeah. I can, I can just imagine if at some point the cat's moving from room to room, all these clickings going <laughs> on, it might be, it might be distracting. It, I mean, I, it's, it, I've heard about it, and I've, I've seen bits and pieces. There yeah. are programs that are now going on in shelters for clicker there training are. to there help are. with the cats that aren't adjusting well to the shelter environment to help them yes. being able to show, um, show better. But it still is a bit baffling from the catitude mentality that I have in my head where I just, I cannot imagine some of my cats, you know, going that route. I maybe can imagine some of my cats, the dog-like ones, maybe right, would appreciate right, right, something right. like that. Yes, well, certain cats would probably respond, well, do respond to it. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it's, it's definitely more of a dedicated, you know, global commitment to do that type of training. I mean, just in terms of, just because we brought up dogs, I mean, I mean, cats are equally as intelligent as dogs. They just might choose to respond to something differently than a dog would. I mean, I I don't know if this is true, but um, I've been reading that the intelligence plateau for cats and dogs alike are, is around two years old, equivalent to a two-year-old. So um, they're both different animals, but if they both mentally think the same way even though we don't know that yeah sure why not try so i think yeah. that my cats are always in the terrible twos yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. if you've had kids that's one way of looking at it yes i'll tell them that when they wake me up at six o'clock in the morning on a saturday morning there you go <laughs> well well rachel just brought up the idea though that a lot of people do project onto their animals and i'm thinking you know if, if when your cat is misbehaving sometimes, if you just remember that they're just acting on another one of their terrible twos events, then maybe you can overlook it. Yeah. Yeah. Right, well there are so many people who think that if a cat goes outside of the box, like they're trying to teach them a lesson or mm -hmm. some type of a revenge pee, and right. cats just don't really think that way. If they don't use the box, something mm -hmm. or someone is preventing them from using that box. And it's my job, to do a little detective work and figure out what that is. But it's definitely not because the cat wants revenge on you, so she's gonna pee on your bed. So before we turn into uh, our current events mm -hmm. with um, Chelsea Hub Cats, uh, Rachel, any final thoughts for anybody who might be having any issues with their cats behaviorally? Well, I would like to let people know that I am available for free 
cat behavior counseling and are you going to be giving my email or would you like me to you can share it right now okay. on, on the oh. air and we'll put it on the credits oh, at great. the end great and would we also make it available on our website yep. we most certainly can do okay. that okay so would my email to. will be on the website and on the credits um, but for right now my email is dr rachel geller at gmail.com and that's d r r a c h e l g e l l e r at gmail.com fantastic and I hope people do reach out to you. I hope so too. You know. And I am 100% available. I respond to every email and I, I don't give up. So I'm 100% dedicated to what I do and I will help as much That's as I great. can. And if you get a lot of contacts, we're happy to arrange for you to do a group session here. Or sure. Something. There are lots of public rooms in Chelsea. And so we'd be happy to facilitate you know, any sort of a workshop that you want to do here. That's great. I'm on board. Um, so Laura, we have... Uh, upcoming events. Um, just to remind folks, if you do have a cat or a dog and you're a Chelsea resident, you can get your cat or dog spayed or neutered for free through a grant that mm -hmm. we have. Mm -hmm. And that's the, um, what are the intervals? Are we offering, um, I, I know we have a clinic coming up in June, but um, is this independent of the clinic that somebody could call and make an appointment? Yep. Um, so folks, if they're interested in getting their cat or dog spayed or neutered, um, they can call 857-776-2287, and that's our Hubcats line. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, Mary Ann, who answers most of the phone calls, will be able to assist in finding you um, a resource, a spay-neuter resource. We have three different providers that we are working with. So uh, she'll get you hooked up with the right place to get and, everybody um, spayed or neutered. I do believe that just through Hubcats um, and the community that we can offer rides. Yeah, we now have a volunteer network of about six or eight different volunteers that are willing to help with doing transport. So we have a partnership with the MSPCA in Jamaica Plain in Boston. And if you don't have access to transportation, still do call us and we can arrange for a volunteer to help with the, with the transport. So we will make sure that your kitty and your dog get, get done. Um, and then June 11th is the date of our rabies and microchipping clinic. And, and what location are we at that day? We're still choosing it. So uh -huh. the location is to be determined. Um, we are having a meeting later, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, but on June 11th, save the date, and we'll make sure we get the details out. Be on the lookout for the details of the location. And that's gonna be free rabies vaccinations and free microchipping for dogs and for cats. Um, we're going to have a second um, vaccination and microchipping clinic uh, in September. So if you miss June, no worries, but we hope everybody comes to June. Um, and, um, and that will be fun and great, and we'll make sure we get all those details together for everybody. And um, every Tuesday, the first Tuesday of every month, yep. um, we meet uh, typically at the police station um, in the community room. We have our... Um, monthly meeting of Chelsea Hubcats and like to invite anybody who's interested to come and stop by and find out what we're doing and volunteer. Yep, that's right. It's at 630 and we always need lots of volunteers. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Since January we've assisted 65 cats um, and I think over 25 dogs at this point in time with free spay and neuter. And um, our goal is to assist over 200 cats in the course of the year. And then our vaccination clinics, we're hoping to get 300 animals at the two clinics. So we really wanna make a serious impact you know, in Chelsea. Um, with that, we're entering into kitten season. We didn't touch on kittens too much. Um, we didn't, you'll have to have me back again. I will yeah. have to, <laughs> we'll talk about kittens and some of the things my, my daughter is fostering a kitten right now. and I. I was reminding her, you know, you know, did you get the right type of litter? Did you make sure she can get into the litter box right, okay and right. all that stuff? Um, and um, but we need kitten supplies, so KMR, baby food without garlic and onion, um, you know, kitten wet food, kitten dry I'm food. Sorry, do, do they make 
baby food with they, garlic, some of them and have onion. Onion, garlic okay. and onion in it. I mean, it? I'm thinking about the chicken and the turkey. Well, like the, if that you do like bland. chicken stay, and peas. Stay away from the stews. Yeah, yeah. the stews. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. so yeah. it's just plain old turkey, the little, little jars. Oh, oh, right. It'd be strained. So it'd be yeah. like for like a one year old as opposed to an Yeah, I think it's called older. second generation or something like that. Yeah. And I don't even have children, but I know these things because I have cats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I bought more baby food when I was fostering cats yes. and kittens <laughs> than, you know, any, any other time. Um, but like, like Laura mentioned, volunteers, we really need help. We need help with fundraising. You know, we, we plan to be here forever helping the cats in Chelsea. Uh, my motto is no cat left behind in Chelsea. Um, and so, um, but I just, I want to thank both of you for coming. Mm -hmm. And Thank sharing you. with us this afternoon, it's been great um, catching up with you. It's great to see you. We we spoke on the phone about a month and a half ago or yes. so, and so it's great to meet you in person. So thank you for that, um, Laura. As always, thank you for organizing this show, event, putting it together, being our outreach coordinator. So appreciate that. Um, to find out more about Hubcats Chelsea, please please go to our website at hubcatschelsea.com, or call eight five seven 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 six. 2287. You can always check us out on Facebook and I believe we are also on Twitter. Um, thank you again for tuning in and we will see you again in the future and as next I said time. before, see you next mm -hmm. time and um, there'll be no cat left behind in Chelsea. Take care. Mm -hmm.